Hello, all you witches and wizards and kindred spirits. Welcome back to It's a Sign podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Today in this episode, we will be covering the mythical lost land of Hyperborea. Hyperborea is a land shrouded in mystery and legend, said to be located in the far north beyond the reach of the sun. According to ancient Greek and Roman writers, Hyperborea was a paradise-like realm inhabited by a blessed people who enjoyed a peaceful and prosperous life. The myth of Hyperborea has captured the imaginations of scholars, explorers, and spiritual seekers for centuries. Some have speculated that the legend of Hyperborea may have been inspired by real ancient civilizations that existed in the far north, while others have looked to the myth as a source of spiritual wisdom and insight. In this episode, we'll explore the origins of the Hyperborean myth and delve into the different interpretations of this legendary land. We'll examine the theories surrounding the location and nature of Hyperborea and consider the possible influences that the myth may have had on ancient and modern cultures alike. Join us on this journey into the heart of one of the most fascinating and enduring legends of the ancient world, the lost continent of Hyperborea. Transition. Hi guys, welcome back to the podcast. It's a joy to be back so soon. So soon, yeah, without a giant break in between. Yeah, <laughs> we've made a bad habit of that recently. Well, it's it's not really our fault. We've been kind of uprooted, but yeah. there are other people who <laughs> are better at keeping up with that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and it's definitely a passion project. We don't get paid to do this, but we enjoy coming here as often as we can Yeah. to you know, go into some interesting topics. Yeah, because we really love everything that we're researching. It's really mm-hmm. our passions, and we are so curious about all these things. So we're learning alongside all of you, and yeah, it's a great fun to do together, especially. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, we're excited again today to look into another lost continent, the same, similar to our previous episode. Yeah, this one, the last one was almost like a lost city. This one almost seems to be an entirely lost continent. Which um, I'm excited to hear about, yeah. Because yeah. I was thinking that about last episode. Mm-hmm. We will be heading to Thailand later this week. Yeah. And we'll be there for a month and we will continue to try and keep up episodes each week. But we will see how that goes um, depending on our situation and how uprooted we are. But it should be okay. Um, and who knows, Thailand may inspire us into explore some myths, legend, and ancient history we've never even dreamt of before. Who knows? We're open to the adventure, for sure. All right, Creppy, why don't you start us off? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in this episode. No. <laughs> awesome. So, The Lost Land of Hyperborea. Have you ever heard of it before? No. Okay. I've heard about it very briefly, but in a kind of different context through Helena Blavatsky, and we'll kind of go into her perspective of this land later on, towards the end of the episode. But it was the year 450 BC when the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the Hyperborea a kingdom whose people were affluent and influential enough to transmit goods all the way from the northern reaches of Europe to the island of Delos in Greece. Their lives were described by the classical Greek poet Pindar. Quote, Never the muse is absent from their ways. Lyres clash and flutes cry, and everywhere maiden choruses whirling. Neither disease nor bitter old age is mixed in their sacred blood from Far from labor and battle they live. So, Hyperborea is, but in the old in the old and ancient maps, oh. it was a land located in the far north, at the North Pole, pretty much, and it was a continent um, 
that existed there, which is obviously not there anymore. When we go north, we see Norway, Iceland, and you know Greenland, and a couple of those mm. other countries. But there's not one landmass that's there. So, did it exist at some point and sunk beneath the ocean? We're going to discover that today. Hyperborea is a location in Greek mythology, and the inhabitants of this mythical land are known as Hyperboreans, whom the ancient Greeks believed enjoyed extremely long lives. Hyperborea is mentioned by a number of Greek and Roman writers, including Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, and Pindar. Although Hyperborea is a mythical land, there has been speculation over the ages that it is a real place on Earth, or at least it was. And this has led to a number of theories about its exact location. In addition, attempts have been made to connect the Hyperborean with real historic people. The name Hyperborea may be translated to mean beyond the Borea. And what that kind of makes me imagine beyond is like... the Borea. No, beyond like <laughs> the Borealis, you know? You know the northern lights? Oh, like yeah, the, yeah. The the what's it called aurora, aurora borealis so it really ma- invokes this magical picture in my mind like beyond the northern lights you know yeah kind of this very mystical land that these people are talking about and there's a really cool theory that i like that the north and south pole produce um these borealis due to a huge influx of electromagnetic frequencies interacting with the atmosphere and when we kind of discuss even the south pole myths and legends they say that there is a entrance to inner earth a hole within the ground upon which the energy of the earth pours out in a pillar from this hole and unleashes into the aurora borealis Mm. Um, the native people of america were very in tune with the Aurora Borealis, and they said that was how the spirits communicated with them. And if you've ever seen um, the Aurora... God, I'm really having trouble saying Aurora. Aurora Borealis, um, even if it's in just video footage... You could just say the Northern Lights. Yeah, the Northern Lights in high-definition video footage. They're really, really magical to watch. And... That's on my bucket list. I definitely want to go. Yeah, I think it's on probably most people's bucket list. Like anyone, I don't think I know anyone who wouldn't want to experience that. Yeah, we definitely have to go make a trip up to those northern countries and stay during the time. It'd be amazing. My uncle lives in Finland, so we could stop there and then head up. That'd be very cool. Yeah. So... According to Greek, there, oh, there's another interpretation where it also means beyond the north wind. North wind is personified by the god Boreas, you know, Bo- and so it's the land literally of Boreas, the god. Um, and it, he was said to live in an ancient place called Thrace in Greek, uh, Thrace, and therefore Hyperborea would logically be placed to the north of Thrace. Hyperborea, however, was one of the terrae incognitae, which is Latin for unknown lands of the ancient Greeks and Romans. These were regions which have neither been mapped nor documented. In other words, Hyperborea might very well be a place that exists only in myth, and many of the stories told about Hyperborea and the Hyperboreans are quite mystical. So... One of the ancient writers who mentions Hyperborea many times in his work is the Greek historian Herodotus, and he is attributed with the title The Father of History, and he wrote about Hyperborea in book four of his histories. In one part of this book, Herodotus writes, Aristius, the son of Castrobus, who came from Pronysus, claimed in a poem that he visited the Essedones in a state of inspiration by Apollo, that beyond the Essodines lived a one-eyed race called the Arimaspians. Beyond them, there is the land of the gold-guarding griffins, and beyond them, the Hyperboreans, all the way to the sea. All these people from 
Arimaspians on, except the Hyperboreans are constantly attacking their neighbors. So he's saying there's a, there's a lot of stuff to the north. There's Cyclops, one-eyed giants <laughs> living up there. There's a bunch of different races that are constantly at war, but the Hyperboreans are in peace. And here is a little map again of what they depicted Hyperborea to look like right at the North Pole. This mythical land has also been mentioned by two of ancient Greece's most revered poets, Hesiod and Homer. And, quote, none of the tribes living there, including the Scythians, have anything to say about the Hyperboreans. Perhaps the Isidones do, but I do not think so, because if the Scythians would have stories about them too, just as they do about the one-eyed people. Hesiod, however, has mentioned the Hyperboreans, and so has Homer in the Ep Epigoni, which is a text that he wrote. Herodotus then points out that most of the stories about the Hyperboreans are told by the inhabitants of the sacred island of Delos. The overwhelming majority of the stories about the Hyperboreans come from Delos, and the historian goes on to relate some of the tales about the Hyperboreans in which Delos, as one might expect, plays a prominent role. One of these, for instance, relates to the way sacred objects were transported from Hyperborea to Delos. The Delians say that sacred objects are tied up inside a bundle of wheat straws and are transported from the Hyperboreans first to Scythia, then westward as far as possible. Um, so there's, there's a lot of texts talking about how there was a trade with this, this nation to the north and that they mm -hmm. were bringing sacred objects. But what are those sacred objects and what did they contain that's kind of been lost to history. Yeah, the next story kind of goes on about why they were delivered and why they were hidden in certain in certain like bales of hay and it was actually to um, hide it from pirates. So if pirates attacked, you know, and invaded their ships, they would not know that the sacred objects were on board. Mm -hmm. um, now, the death of the young woman who came from hy the Hyperboreans is commemorated on Delos by a hair-cutting ritual performed by the girls and boys of the island. Before they get married, the girls cut off a lock of hair, wind it around a spindle, and put it on the tomb, which is inside the sanctuary of Artemis. On the left, as one enters, an olive tree has grown over it, and the Delian boys wind some of their hair around a twig and put it on the tomb as well. So that is how these Hyperborean women are worshipped by the inhabitants of Delos. Herodotus' last story about the Hyperboreans is that of Arge and Opus, a pair of women who also travelled from Hyperboreus, Hyperborea to Delos. The women are said to have made the journey before Hyper, Hyperachi and Laudis, through a, though for a different purpose. Argy and Opus went to the island in order to pay tribute and the Greek goddess of childbirth in exchange for a quick and easy labor. So according to Herodotus, the Delians claim that the two women were accompanied by the gods themselves, perhaps beings of an advanced civilization within the north of Hyperborea, and received different honors when they came to Delos. It was said that their tombs are situated behind the grounds of the sanctuary of Artemis, facing east right next to the banqueting hall of the sea. And so that's kind of a little bit of history um, of Hyperborea and where we're getting some of the mentions of it. And we do want to go into kind of what Hyperborea was like. And he begins to describe um, Pliny the Elder in one of his books that the kind of location and description of it. So he says, along the Black Sea, coast of Europe, as far as the river Tanais, known today as the Don, are the Maote, from whom the lake derives its name, and the last of all, in the rear of them, the Arimaspi. We then came to the river mountains in the region known by the name of Pterophoros because of the perpetual fall of snow there the flakes of which resemble feathers, a part of the world which has been condemned by the decree of nature to lie immersed in thick darkness, suited for nothing but the generations of cold. Behind these mountains, and beyond the region of the northern winds, there dwells, if we choose, a happy race known as the Hyperborea, eternally blessed with sunlight. So... so 
the, so they're in darkness. But then no, so it's a dark, it's, like in it's a Sweden, dark, where... frozen place, tundra, and then beyond the northern winds is a land that's eternally blessed with sunlight. Oh, because I was gonna say it's interesting that they were like eternally happy if it's like dark all the time, mm. because obviously we know, um, like that can cause depression and darkness. Yeah, the one thing it reminds me of is um, Admiral Byrd's visit to the South Pole and how he said that everything was covered in snow and then all of a sudden he... And when we when people talk of Antarctica, there's a lot of like uh, bad visibility and strong winds and stuff like that going over. That's why planes don't really like to fly over Antarctica because it's quite... Um, dangerous flight conditions but when Admiral Byrd did it he said that at some point all of a sudden the land began to change and that all of a sudden the sky was full of light and he began to see you know creatures and um, green fields and all of that yeah well now you can't you couldn't fly over it even if you wanted to well there's there's planes there's planes that go to Antarctica the government no you can get buy a commercial plane from Cape Town to Antarctica. Okay. For quite an expensive price. I was looking it up on YouTube. I didn't think he was allowed to go. Yeah, you can. I've I've seen like dozens of different people doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's an there's a commercial airstrip, one commercial airstrip in the very south of Antarctica, and yeah, you can you can buy tickets to go there. I was looking it up. All right. Yeah, well, and why there's does also everyone say that you can't go there. I don't know. That's because I was always I always heard that, you know. Yeah. And so I looked it up and literally found dozens and dozens of videos. I was like scrolling through them, watching them of people going and and visiting Antarctica, and even flying over and taking video footage of it on like tours and stuff. Yeah. So. Weird. Yeah. Later chroniclers would elaborate on Pindar and Herodotus' accounts of these exotic northern people. Greeks credited the Hyperborean as a genius people untouched by the usual hardships faced by humanity, like war and old age. So advanced were Hyperboreans that, according to the Greeks, it was in fact them who built the great temple of Apollo at Delphi. It was from their land that the god Apollo originated and which a theocracy ruled with three priest kings serving in Apollo's name at its head. Here immediately we kind of have again another parallel of just this advanced race who built the large temples and stuff like that. In the previous episode of Azatlan we saw that the be, there were beings who built the Great Pyramids in Egypt, it was Thoth and the Atlanteans. So, and as we get more into Helena Blavatsky's work, we'll begin to see that the, the Hyperborean, the Lemurian, and the Atlantis were all epochs and stages within humanity. Mm. Um, but we'll get in that, into that in a little bit more. Of the many writings of Hyperborea, most have been lost to time. Fortunately, the writings of Dio- Diodorus a Greek historian of the first century BC have survived. He preserved a fragment from another historian of the fourth century BC who described the whereabouts of the Hyperboreans. Quote, in the region beyond the land of the Celts, there lies in the ocean an island no smaller than Sicily. This island, the account continues, is situated in the north and is inhabited by the Hyperboreans who are called by that name because their home is beyond the point whence the north wind borealis blows, and the island is both fertile and productive of every crop and has an unusually temperate climate. So once again we're talking about this northern land that's meant to be covered in snow, but surprisingly can produce any sort of crop and is very warm and temperate. Mm. The Hyperboreans also have a language which is peculiar to them and are most friendly disposed towards the Greeks and especially towards the Athenians and the Delians. They also say that the moon, the moon as viewed from this island appears to be but a little distance from the earth and to have upon it prominences like those of the earth which are visible to the eye. So what they're saying here is that at this point in this land 
the moon seems very, very close, and they can see the ridges, grooves, and mountains that mirror that of the Earth. Very interesting. The mirror, eh? And they're visible to the naked eye. Hakateus, further elaborated by the Hyperboreans, is having a magnificent, a magnificent sacred precinct of Apollo and a notable temple which is adorned with many votive offerings and is, in, is, is spherical in shape. The descriptions of spherical temples have led many to believe that it was Stonehenge which Hecatus was describing, thus placing Hyperborea in Britain. Um, yet this theory does not match with some of the more notable descriptions of Hyperborea, many describing it as having 24 hours of sunlight and only one sunrise and sunset a year. Very interesting. Such a description places Hyperborea in the Arctic Circle, leading many to conclude that it was in fact a classical Scandinavian kingdom. In many respects, this makes sense. Certainly the legend of Hercule Hercules involving him hunting the golden antler hide of Artemis in Hyperborea, reindeer being the only deer whose females bear antler, easily locates Hyperborean Scandinavia. Similar descriptions can also be made of Russia's Siberian regions where recent archaeological evidence has indicated that there existed a high level of civilization at one point. In the Ural Mountains of Siberia in particular, some sites contain evidence to indicate that every house in the area was engaged in copper and bronze metallurgy. This means that the ancient population of Siberia were not only industrious, but lived comfortably for the time with ovens, food storage, wells for fresh water. Although the dates of these sites are much older than Herodotus' writing, dating around to the second millennium BC, so almost 4,000 years ago, it does show that an advanced civilization could have existed near or in the Arctic Circle, um, contemporary with classic Greek culture. It must, however, not be forgotten that Hyperborea has often been described as an island or a continent surrounded by sea. The Greeks were not the only ones to write of a mysterious island populated by a cultured civilization. In the Irish Book of Invasions, it is stated that some of the Irish population sailed to a mysterious northern island, returning later to Ireland with new knowledge. Bethax, son of Iar Iarbanel, the soothsayer, son of Nemed. There's a lot of crazy names, yeah. and for some reason, I'm having trouble speaking today. <laughs> <laughs> but his descendants went into the northern islands of the world to learn druidry and heathenism and diabolical knowledge so that they became expert in all the arts it's probably quoted by like some sort of christian or in an, in the more recent okay. ages you know fair enough and they were afterwards the thuade danan as we have spoken about in a previous yeah. episode and they came to ireland after 250 years of leaving ireland and it has a similar description to the land of the Thuade Danan, where yeah, they yeah, which is the elves. Yeah, um, we did an episode on that on YouTube. That is up on YouTube, so it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, they were said to have come from the north as well on ships that sailed in the sky, and that their land was the land of eternal sun. Yeah, um, but they were forced into the earth and became an inner earth civilization. But that's another episode. Yeah, could they be from these lands? Yeah, it's possible. It would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Ancient Babylonian accounts also speak of great sages living far to the north. Even ancient Vedic texts from India attest to an advanced civilization of wise men living in the northern lands. But the question... The question that still remains is what happened to Hyperborea? If it is real, then where did it go? And where is the evidence of its existence? Some say that the Hyperboreans moved south over time and helped to craft Celtic culture. Since the Celts are known to have migrated and settled over vast areas in Eurasia, it would help explain why the ex legend exists in so many cultures. And again, we have the parallel of some sort of advanced civilization helping to build um, culture in the other worlds. 
coming back to the Greeks, they really had no reason to think about the world beyond the Western Mediterranean. And while trade and colonization put them in contact with nearby cultures like the Egyptians and the people of Asia Minor, much of the rest of the world remained a mystery to them. As trade routes and travel expanded, the Greeks did come into contact with whole new cultures, and their instinct was to determine how these foreign people fit into their own view of the world. Most Greeks believed their culture to be inherently superior to others, and they not only had law, philosophy, arts, and military techniques, but their gods were very real and powerful to them. Those cultures that could not be identified as Greeks were considered barbarous, barely human in their strangeness. Even barbarians, however, could be seen as distant relatives of lesser god or disgraced men. And in some regions, the local gods were readily accepted as slight variations upon the accepted Greek pantheon. The ancient gods of Egypt, for example, were often seen as the deities of Greece with different names and iconography. Thus, the people of nearby places like Egypt and Turkey were seen as close relatives with the Greeks and their ancient kings were given Greek origin stories and their cultures were seen as civilized and respectable. And in other lands, it was more difficult to link foreign cultures to the Greek view of civilization, and these people were considered distant kin at best and subhuman at worst. So it is interesting that the Greeks regarded this civilization with such high regard, saying how advanced and what how much you know they had in common mm -hmm. so i think that's what the greeks are talking about when they're saying they were particularly kind to the ways of the greek it meant that they were advanced and that they were they would continue to trade with these sacred objects these mysterious sacred objects mm -hmm. with endless spring and eternal light hyperborea was capable of producing two harvests of grain each year and less than half of the work required on a farm in the rocky lands of greece most of the land of hyperborea was left wild though with dense forests and green meadows covering the nation the eridanos river flow flower flowed lazily across the landscape attracting white swans and hyperborea was a land of plenty it was also a land of peace the brutal Rypaean mountains in which Boreas made his home made the so southern border of Hyperborea impassable by even the hardiest travel travelers. Cannibal tribes lived in its valleys and griffins guarded the high passes. The primordial river Oceanus protected the country from the north, while a few Greek sailors had reached the river that encircled the world, none had ever navigated it. Hyperborea thus had no fear of invading armies because it was protected by natural defenses. Without the constant threat of war, the people lived a peaceful existence that most Greeks could only dream of. It reminds me of like the land of the elves in Lord of the Rings. It's like surrounded by mountains and mm. you can only go there if you know where it is. You know, it's like very hard to enter. Oh, in like, Earth. Yeah. But it, it could be, like, what I was thinking when you was talking is, like, it sounds to me like, especially with the connection with Ireland and the people, like, and how advanced they were for the time, like, it could definitely be, like, another entrance for Inner Earth. Yeah. Like they say that there's an entrance at both ends of the poles, you know, and maybe it was more of a, like, thing, the North Pole back in that time, and... You know, um, I know no one really talks so much about the North Pole entrance anymore. It's it's all more about the South Pole because I guess in our like um, generation we had we've heard about people like Edward Bird and you know we have him on video. It feels a lot more real. Yeah. Um. So we haven't had like anything come out in this kind of time of technology about North Pole, but they do say that there is entrances at both poles for Inner Earth, and so it feels like maybe back then these were people from Inner Earth, and the way it's so difficult to get there, the same with, um, the, you know, the Inner Earth at the South Pole, like, it could definitely be, yeah, the, yeah. The, those same beings that... Had, um, 
you know, Mr. Bird was talking about yeah. meeting and then those beings, which are obviously a type of alien being, they looked, you know, they was the Nordic looking beings mm-hmm. and um, they were very advanced and I don't know, it just seems like it could be the yeah. same people that come from inner earth and but these are the ones that lived at the northern base. Yeah. And they often call Hyperborea a realm. Um, mm. And it might, I don't know if that's just like an old way of speaking, you know, if they called, you know, different countries realms or different continents mm. realms and stuff like that. But they did often call Hyperborea the realm of the eternal sun. So the first kings of the Hyperboreans were said to have been three giant sons of the north wind himself boreas so boreas is this figure that continues to appear and he apparently had three sons that were giants each over 10 feet tall and later the country became again that lines up with like the tall they were pretty much giants the in our elvin episode yeah um, and so was the one seen at the South Pole, very tall. But the elves were, yeah, the, the elves were tall, but they were said to have even battled with giants. So they weren't the giants themselves. But um, when we go into like the Book of Enoch and the Watchers, and that there were those beings who descended from the sky, the sky people, and then bred with the children of Earth, and then they produced giants, you know? And there's giants in almost every mythology and lore and then we've also covered like evidence of giant skeletons found and hidden by the i feel like it was was definitely a race like i don't know i did that's just how i feel about it like um especially like there's a lot of um i think evidence even of the redhead giants and stuff yeah um I think that they just were just like the different types of alien beings and these Nordic beings. I do feel like there's, it's very likely that the Nordic beings are still around, you know, how do do we really know? Yeah. So the Greeks really believed that Apollo lived at some point and maybe over time, Apollo is one of the gods within the Greek pantheon and maybe over time he became immortalized into some sort of omniscient figure, but perhaps he was one of these uh, Hyperboreans. It was said that he spent his winters in Hyperborea, bringing light to the land while Greece endured the darkness of winter, and he and Helios were associated with the far north. And the only physical descriptions of the Hyperboreans were of their kings. The descendants of Boreas and the snow nymph Chione were giants, measuring over 10 feet tall, like we just said, but generally considered to be without deformities common in other giant races. So these would be like titan giant beings, but they they would look normal, only big, whereas there's a lot of other descriptions, like the Cyclops and the other giants who were almost deformed in their figure. Like orc-like. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the the Hyperboreans were largely thought to be immune of sickness, of age, and they did not have to toil to work their fertile lands, and disease was unknown to them. If they aged at all, the elderly Hyperboreans jumped into a lake to be transformed into swans. (laughs) The lake was formed by the son of Phaethon, and you can see where kind of maybe fact and myth are starting to blend together. Um, Lost me at the swans. The son of Helios who flew the chariot of the sun too close to the earth. The swans that lived there were in honor of his friend Cygnus, while the graceful poplar trees on its banks were his sisters. And we always see this in oral traditions where they begin to make metaphors Mm. out of um, stories just so that they can can pass it down. Yeah. The Hyperboreans were separated from Greece, but still knew many of the same gods. Although far removed from Greece itself, they were seen as having enough in common to be considered civilized. By the turn of the millennium, Roman conquest had opened up areas of Europe that had never been before explored before, and while the legendary land of Hyperborea was still thought to exist, it could now be compared to other no- northern cultures that had only recently been contacted. 
contacted. As their view of the world expanded, the Greeks came up with seemingly plausible explanations for who the inhabitants of Hyperborea truly were. The most commonly accepted rationalizations were that the Hyperboreans were the same as, or at least closely related to, some of the many tribes conquered by the Romans in Central and Northern Europe. So, some people say that, oh, perhaps the Celts were descendants of the Hyperboreans and the Britons and the Gauls and but it's 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 all just conjecture because they were just trying to rationalize you know who were these people mm -hmm. and no group seemed to perfectly fit the descriptions of the hyperboreans in their lands and the greeks and romans continued to try and identify the legendary people of boreas the celts themselves were divided on the identification and some accepted the similarities between their own people and the greek idea of the hyperboreans but Others, like the Celtic tribes of Ireland, had their own mythologies that contradicted those of the Greeks. The Irish believed that they were themselves once ruled by people farther north, the Thuidae Danann, commonly thought of the Irish gods or elves. And possible other noteworthy aspect of Hyperborea and a possible clue to its location was its wildlife. The swans associated with Cygnus were one of the animals associated with the legendary country. But another was more magnificent. Heracles was another of the rare Greeks to visit the land of Hyperborea while on his quest to capture the Serenitian hind, the golden horned deer that was sacred to Artemis, who fled to the north during the chase, leading Her Heracles far from, the, far from Greece. The deer was eventually captured in Hyperborea, its homeland. But the description of the deer is seen by some historians as an important clue about the location of the myth. The hind was described as female, but also marked by its golden horns. And there are no species of deer native to the region of Greece in which the females have horns. Mm. To find horned female deer, one must travel much farther north than the lands usually identified with Hyperborea. Actually, the only species in Europe that matches the description are reindeer, and reindeer are not native to the regions of Gaul or the islands of Britain. They live much further north. While most commonly associated with Scandinavia, reindeer can also be found in the tundra regions of northern Asia as far as Siberia. The horned deer might have been a product of the Greek imagination, but its association with legendary land of the north leads many to believe that it was originally a reindeer. But who knows, there could have been some golden horned deer in the past. We don't know what's happened. Um, so... Well, reindeer have, like, furry horns, don't they? Yeah, they do. They don't have, like, golden horns. Yeah. So, who knows? It's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. But... But there are the one, the female. Yeah, that makes sense. But then, like, yeah. Unless, like, it was, like... A light-haired one, like a golden fur, <laughs> that made the horns seem golden. Yeah, in the sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. But it also could be another metaphor to... Yeah, like I think knows. a lot of this stuff is. So now we move on to um, a kind of away from the historical accounts and depictions of it and into Helena Blavatsky's... Okay. And she was a very famous um, psychic and prominent spiritualist and the founder of the Theosophical Society, which was established in 1875. And Blavatsky's work on the Hyperborean Epoch can be found in her book, The Secret Doctrine, which was published in 1888. And I used to have a copy of The Secret Doctrine, but whatever publication I got was literally just like, it was this like big book. And it was just pages and pages of text, not separated by paragraphs, you know, mm, just, painful. It was, and I just like couldn't get myself to dive into it, you know, I know I'm there's surprised. a, I, so most of what I've read on Helena Blavatsky or know about Helena Blavatsky is like through internet articles or, um, people breaking it down or on, in videos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But 
In The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky expounds on her belief that there was a prehistoric epoch known as the Hyperborean Age, which she describes as a time of great spiritual and intellectual development. According to Blavatsky, the Hyperborean civilization was located in the far north and was ruled by godlike beings known as the Elder Brothers. Blavatsky suggested that the Hyperborean civilization was destroyed in a great cataclysm, which she identifies as one of the as either one of the floods or the biblical flood. She argues that survivors of the Hyperborean race dispersed to various parts of the world and became the founders of the world's great civilizations. Blavatsky believed that the Hyperborean civilization was not limited to the physical plane, but existed on a higher spiritual plane as well. She claimed that the Hyperboreans possessed extraordinary psychic powers and were able to communicate telepathically and travel through astral realms. Blavatsky's idea about the Hyperborean civilization were strongly influenced by theosophy and a system of esoteric beliefs that she helped to popularize in the late 19th century. And Blavatsky saw the Hyperborean epoch as a time when humanity was in closer communication with the divine and more attuned to the spiritual realms. She believed that the decline of this civilization and the loss of its spiritual wisdom were responsible for many of the problems that beset humanity in later eras. According to Helena Blavatsky's teaching, the beings who lived in Hyperborea were a highly advanced race and they possessed a deep understanding of the spiritual realms. Blavatsky claimed that the Hyperborean beings were able to communicate telepathically, like we said before, and travel between dimensions of reality. So this could be that they, you know, in the Nordic myths, there, you know, with Thor and these gods, they were seen as bigger giants than human humans, and they had gateways to different worlds, realms, and dimensions, mm-hmm. um, and they could travel between them at will. And there was this they had this um, sacred relic that allowed them to, you know, be transported from one realm to another on this bridge, this bridge, astral bridge of some sort. Now, Blavatsky's vision of the Hyperborean beings was shaped by her theosophical beliefs, which held that there was a hidden wisdom underlying all religions and spiritual traditions. She saw the Hyperboreans as exemplars of this wisdom and believed that they had developed a deep understanding of the spiritual realm that was lost to humanity. According to Theosophy, the Hyperborean Epoch was the second age of the current root race, which was believed to have begun around 18 million years ago. The third and fourth ages of the root race were said to have been even more spiritually advanced than the Hyperborean Epoch, but they were also said to have been destroyed by great cataclysm. And this is where we get into her theory of the root races. So according to her, there were there were five root races. And we are the fifth one right now. So the first was called the Polarian root race. And this was the first, which was said to have existed millions of years ago and have been a purely spiritual and ethereal race without physical bodies. So this was the first development of the human soul, and they were called the Polarians. The second root race was the Hyperborean root race, and it was believed to have inhabited the mythical land of Hyperborea. They were said to have been both physical and ethereal beings. Mm -hmm. Now, the third comes with the Lemurian root race, and it was, they were believed to have inhabited the content of, continent of Lemuria or Mu in the Pacific Ocean. They were said to have been physically different from modern humans with large ethereal bodies and a third eye in the middle of their foreheads. The Atlantean root race. That was the fourth root race, which was believed to have inhabited the legendary island of Atlantis, and they were said to have been a highly advanced civilization, possessing advanced technology and spiritual knowledge. And the root, worry, root race we're in now is called the Aryan root race, 
and it's said to have begun around a million years ago, according to Theosophy, and the Aryan race is characterized by its intellectual and mental faculties as well as, as its capacity for spirituality. And she goes on to say that there will be f a future root race called the sixth root race after us. So there will be another sort of cataclysm that shifts the tides, and then there will be mm -hmm. the sixth root race. They will... Whereas the Aryan race is characterized by its intellect and mental faculties, which mm. we can see in the world today, the sixth root race will be will have a greater understanding of the spiritual realms once more. And then she ends it with saying that the seventh root race will be the future root race that is the final stage of humans' evolution on Earth. Okay. So, mm. and that's that's her theories. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's just a reminder to people listening that is like channeled work. It's not, um, yeah, she's not like a scientist. No. But um, it definitely resonates with me. Like of a lot of, um, I haven't looked loads into her stuff, but a lot of other channelers and mediums that I do tune into their work, you know, that I definitely believe in a lot of these past races, even though I haven't heard of the ones we're talking about today so it's really interesting to hear about this because obviously they were way back yeah um but you you know you often hear about past lives in atlantis and lemuria you yeah know? so it's really interesting to hear um it laid out that way yeah, yeah. i definitely have like ancient memories of atlantis like fragments of Lemuria but nothing goes back further than that mm -hmm. for me in terms of like what sort of visions I've had in, ter in recollection and stuff like that um, uh, and I but I can only imagine that some, what like a non-physical race would be like I can, it's quite easy to imagine for me that you know an ethereal state of humanity before we descended into the physical plane and yeah. incar began the incarnation cycle on earth it's almost like we were you know just in the womb getting to know earth and the energies before we decided yeah. to incarnate through the hyperborean race it's interesting because like when earlier in this episode we was talking about how when they got sick they would go into this water and turn into swans and like instantly in my mind's eye I just thought angels mm. and I was like oh I wonder if this is like you know a type of angelic race is this when angels were because like beginning to play with the idea of living on earth and experiencing the earth-based life mm. um and like I definitely know um like I told you, I've had visions of you having an angelic like a past life. Like I yeah. really strong um, sense of that, and I do get that. You know, I do think that possibly that it could be, um, you know, maybe the more angelic race. Yeah, couldn't be. I mean, we also there's always there's also those links to like the druids that the druids went off to the north, learned knowledge, and then came back and. The druids are always attributed with their myth mythical mystical powers is like attunement with nature and being able to shape shift mm. into different animals and things like that, and you know that 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 comes in also in some of the uh, tribal American societies um, cultures too, and the ability for shamans and things to shape shift and all that, um, and. Yeah, there are tribes there that also speak of being visited by beings who live in the ocean towards the north um, and that they appeared very much like how Admiral Byrd descri described them, Nordic beings. He said they they looked like humans, with, but they were taller and slender with these weird suits. And yeah. I'll put, uh, put a video link up to that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I love like exploring 
um, the ideas of these lost continents and like anything even if it's like completely out there stuff that's like oh there's secret continents we don't even know about like that was what yeah. got me really into Admiral Byrd's um, story and um, he you know his whole experience was because he saw a land like beyond Antarctica that is bigger than the continent of the United States so like to me I've always found like that idea um, so exciting and even if yeah this is going into the past it's still exciting to hear about but who knows you know yeah. I feel like there could still be unexplored lands and that really stays with me in my heart like I feel like we don't know everything yet here um, Earth is a very magical place and it's not um, so black and white as science today likes to to make everything. Yeah. I think there's still a lot of magic to be explored on this planet. Yeah, and while there's not much evidence, you know, no evidence really other than the stories passed down through the generations, it I love it when it gets, you know, makes me have a different view and time scale of a potential history for mm. humanity because the more I look into these things the more I think we've been through a lot as humankind you know this is not the first time we've reached this you know height of civilization and it's not in and this isn't what it used to look like you know we've come in a very different way you know we see no evidence of plastics of all these other, you know, horrible things that we're contaminating the earth with. But I still believe that there, there were different versions of advanced civilizations and that there wasn't just one, you know. Graham Hancock talks a lot about, like, one at the end of the Younger Dryas period towards the end of the Ice Age, um, 11, 11 to 12,000 years ago. But what if there were more beyond that? And what if yeah. humanity has is in these cycles of these great you know cataclysms on earth because you know it's very that happens and we have the evidence of these cataclysms and w who knows how long humanity has been going along for yeah and i think definitely like the more like people have um, woken up to a lot of these ideas these concepts woken up to their own spirituality um, I think a lot of us can feel in our hearts that there's so much more to our story here as souls, as humans, and um, as we currently are in this form, there's, there's so much more um, to be told of this story on Earth than we've been taught necessarily by school and science. So yeah. it's definitely fun. Um, I feel like sometimes like in the myths, they're almost like little clues, you know, yeah. that you can piece together and, and almost go within yourself and within your own heart and, and your own consciousness and, and see what unravels there for you. Um, so it is always fun to explore these ideas. We hope that you enjoyed this. And yeah. Um, definitely let us know your thoughts in the comments we really appreciate it we appreciate that more people have been coming to watch our episodes recently mm -hmm. um, so we're really super grateful for that and if you stuck with us um, and you're watching the full episodes even more so thank you so much yeah and feel free to give us a like comment maybe what you'd like to see and we'll definitely take those into account and subscribe yeah subscribe buy us a copy with our new buy us a coffee link you setting that up yeah I'm gonna cool. set it up. <laughs> but only if you want to support like don't feel obliged yeah we appreciate you just being here and watching as it is yeah so yeah thank you so much guys and we will see you next time whenever that will be hopefully it won't be too long and we'll be coming at you from thailand in... hopefully we can't guarantee yeah yeah cool bye <laughs>